What's good, family? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Listen, today's message is one of the most critical sermons you're going to ever hear. It's going to change your life, your view on God. Man, your whole theology is going to be blown up. Today's word today is entitled, man, when God's goodness becomes a problem. Do me a favor, don't watch it by yourself. Get a coworker, family member, or friend as we get ready to go into the word of God. But we just want to take a little time in the Word today to point our hearts heavenward as we prepare to partake of the sacraments of His broken body and His shed blood. Just a few brief announcements quickly, though. Uh, there was a business meeting scheduled for this evening. We're going to postpone that. Uh, we're a little bit displaced today uh, as many of our youth and uh, our children and their families and parents are celebrating and being a part of the Federation today. So we're going to postpone that where we can have the full attention of the body of Christ. There are some things that we need to bring to your attention, some good things that we want you to be aware of. So that business meeting has been postponed. And we ask that you would, again, pray for our young people as they are away at Federation this afternoon. So today, friends, we're going to go ahead and get into the Word. Is that all right? So do me a favor, stand to your feet as we go into the scriptures this afternoon, and we're going to be brief today as we prepare to transition to the table shortly. I want to invite you to go back with me in your Bibles to the book of Jonah chapter 3. Now, some of you all here a couple of weeks ago where we studied the book of Jonah, anybody remember that? Where we talked under the subject, you're going the wrong way. And there are some things that we learned from the word just two Sabbaths ago. One of the things that we learned from Jonah is that agreement is not a prerequisite for obedience. Come on and say amen. And then we learn that sometimes when we go through storms, that storms are not for our destruction. Storms are actually for our direction. And then we learn from the word of God uh, when they refuse at, at first to throw Jonah from the ship, don't let somebody else's drama cause you to sink. Amen. And so today I want us to go back for just a little longer to the book of Jonah, this communion Sabbath, because in many ways, it embodies the grace of God in a way that I had not previously considered. Jonah chapter 3, and we're going to read a good bit, but we'll be skipping back and forth, so be prepared to adjust. Jonah chapter 3, when you get there, let me hear you say amen. Jonah chapter 3, the Bible says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise and go to Nineveh that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh did what? They believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. And do not let them drink water. And verse 10 says this. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. Somebody should say amen to that. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Then chapter 4 says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry I mean they repented said I want to be baptized and the preacher gets mad about this thing so he prayed to the Lord and said our Lord was not this what I said when I was still in my own country therefore I fled previously to Tarshish for I know that, listen to what he says. Listen to his complaint, church. He says, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. 
Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Today, saints, for just a little while, I want to talk under the subject, when God's goodness becomes a problem. Let's pray together quickly. Father, in this little while, would you please say much? And Father, your love is greater than what human verbiage can disclose, discuss, or declare. So Lord, through the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you allow just for us to get a glimpse of your love? May it settle upon our hearts. And Lord, I pray that we would not just see Jonah's ruin, but let us see our own and clasp to your grace as if for our last breath. Hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those who believe say together, amen. And amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, talking today on the subject when God's goodness is a problem. You know, friends, there are occasions in my home where my kids do some things that they're not supposed to do. And in frustration, I will threaten punishments of all sorts. So at times, I will promise early bedtime or I'll withhold a device, and there is this escalating scale of justice depending on what the offense may be. But there are times where because of life's busyness or fatigue that I may forget or I may choose to change my mind about applying the punishment. And this at times has worked in favor of all of the kids at times. However, when one child receives grace, the other two will point out and remind me to say, Daddy, you said they would get early bedtime. They would say, Daddy, you said their devices are going to be withhold. In an attempt to out one another, they will remind me of the offense and the dedicated punishment. And when they see that I'm not responding or that I've changed my mind, they get an attitude with me. And it's interesting because the irony is that when their trespass was overlooked, it wasn't a problem. When their offense was forgiven, it was okay. When their misbehavior was shown grace, they thought I was a good dad. But when I showed grace to one of their siblings, my character gets indicted. And there is a certain absurdity in this dialogue because there are times where I have to remind them when you did X and how you got away with it. And the message ultimately, friends, is not that you're going to get away with doing bad, but when your friend gets grace, you ought to celebrate it because it means at least that grace might still be available to you. And friends, there is a danger in developing amnesia about how much grace we've received. Because the truth is that we become advocates for the law when we forget where God has found us. And at times we have the temerity to only celebrate the grace that God applied yesterday as if we're still not living by grace on today. In fact, there are some of us that treat grace like welfare that helped us get back on our feet and now we're sustained by our own merit and power. But do I have a witness that not only were we saved by grace back in the day, I'm still saved by grace even today. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And it's crazy because this is the offense of the cross because we like to apply grace selectively. We believe those that we like deserve grace, that those that we're close to deserve grace. But we kind of get upset when God shows grace to those that we don't like or that those that have done us harm. And see what happens is when God shows grace to those we don't like, we try to put all types of stipulations 
regulations around grace. We try to put parameters around grace. We begin to put certain conditions around grace because we feel certain people don't deserve it. But how many of us realize that grace by definition is God's unmerited and unwarranted favor so that it's not grace if it's given to the deserving. It's not grace if it's given to those who warrant it. How many of us know that grace can only be given to those that don't deserve it? And see, I'm at a place, church, where I'm not trying to count out God's mercies to you. I'm just so thankful that God has given grace to me that I'm celebrating whenever God shows grace to my brothers. Is there anybody thankful today that God does not treat us as we deserve, but according to the multitude of his tender mercies, does he deal with all of his children? Can you say amen? So, so go back with me, if you don't mind, to Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 1. The Bible says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the Bible says, a second time. Now, again, there are just three brief grace motifs that I want to espouse today. And the first thing Jonah's story teaches us is, number one, you ought not ever squander your second chance. No, notice what the word says. The word says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Okay, some of y'all missed y'all shout. It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Y'all still, still not getting it. The word says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And see, the reason the word has to come a second time is because Jonah rejected it the first time. And see, when the word comes to Jonah a second time, it is proof that God is not just showing mercy to Nineveh, that God is showing mercy unto Jonah. In other words, I need you to know that when the word comes a second time, it's proof that he hasn't given up on Jonah. It's proof he has not repented place Jonah, it's evidence that he's still fooling with a rebellious prophet called Jonah. And it's amazing because in chapter 3, we see Jonah making the most of his second chance. He does not presume that there will be a third or fourth or a fifth chance. He is all the way in with his second chance. Now, when you get home, you've got to read Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 when he is in the belly of the fish. In verse 1, he says, I cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord heard me in my affliction. He he says the waves passed over me that the waters were about to overtake me he says the seedweed was around my head and yet I made it up in my mind that I will look toward his temple in other words friends Jonah prays a crisis prayer I don't know about you church but have you ever found yourself praying in a crisis where, where like Jonah, you can feel yourself going under, where you can feel life closing in, where you can feel you are about to get, man, the reward of your evil deeds, and you prayed a prayer that went something like this. Lord, if you get me out of this one, Lord, if you see me through one more time, Lord, if you hang with me here, I'll serve you better if you give me another chance. And see, the word for somebody today is that don't abandon the covenant you made in trouble when God removes your trouble. Let me say it again. Don't abandon the covenant you made in trouble whenever God removes the trouble. In other words, church, don't act brand new when you get back on your feet. Don't forget what you prayed when your child was still in the world. Don't forget how you said you would treat her if she came back home. Don't forget what you said you would do when you were sitting there in the hospital. Don't go back the old way because the pregnancy test came back negative. In other words, church, sometimes God has to renew the trouble so you renew your covenant. Oh, y'all mighty quiet. Sometimes he's got to let the trouble return so that your righteousness will return. 
And it's funny, church, because in this moment, your boy Jonah is so grateful for a second chance that his gratitude shows up as fuel for his obedience. At this place, he is so thankful that he'll go wherever God says go. He'll do whatever God says do. And he'll say whatever God puts in his spirit. And the reason he'll do it is because his gratitude is fresh. And see, one of the things I've come to believe, friends, is that when your gratitude is fresh, guess what? Your obedience is great. But when you let your gratitude become stale, guess what? Your obedience gets stale as well. In fact, when you read chapters 3 and 4, you literally see a progression at work that as long as he is grateful, he does good and obeys. But when his gratitude wears off and he walks in his self-worthiness, then his obedience begins to get stale. And that's why, friends, I don't believe that we have to always look at our sinful past, but we need some mechanisms in place to keep us mindful of where God brought us from. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And so the word comes to Jonah a second time. And to his credit, at least initially, he goes all the way in with his second chance. He does not presume a third chance. He does not presume a fourth chance. He does not squander the additional mercy that God extends to his life. But the thing I want to pause to say, beloved, is that the greatest regrets in life should not be the mistakes that we make. It ought to actually be the second chances we squander. In other words, I need somebody to understand that God has built grace into your life. He has literally built it into the margins of your journey because God knows that our fra- knows our frame and he remembers that we are but dust. He knows that you're going to mess up along the way, but that's not really the issue. The problem is not my mistakes. The problem is how I handle my second chance. And see, the proof of the truth is today is that some of us have been given multiple chances to amend our habits so that we can preserve our health. Some of us have been given a second chance to better our home and re-win the hearts of our spouses. Some of us have gotten a second chance to get back into school and fulfill your purpose. Some of us have gotten a second chance in grace to turn away from wickedness. But the question is, are you going to abuse your second chance? And see, friends of mine, I need you to know I'm old enough and just walking with God long enough to know that God is not so exacting to where he only gives you one chance. And if you mess up, he moves on. But God is going to build elasticity into your journey so that you have room to turn from the errors that you have made so that all of us are going to get at least one second chance. In fact, let me pause and amend myself mid-sermon. It's actually a sin to call him the God of a second chance. Because how many of us know that we used our second chance a long time ago? He's not the God of a second chance. He's the God of another chance. He's the God who is abundant in mercy. Is there anybody that's thankful that you've had more chances than you can count on both hands? But God does not deal with us as we deserve, but he deals with us as grace. In other words, I need somebody to know that every day you wake up, is another chance to get in covenant with God. I've been living 16,933 days and that's 16,000 chances that God has given me to walk in relationship with him. And that's why the Bible says to number your days that you might apply your heart unto wisdom. And see, the thing I want to say, friends of mine, is that the proof that you're thankful for a second chance is not your shout. The proof you're grateful is your obedience. See, the way you say thank you for mercy is not with your mouth or outstretched hands. It is with a life that is in harmony with God. 
Okay, let me say it this way. I remember when I first had graduated from school, I had a little credit card my parents gave me, and I, I didn't always do right by that credit card. Do I have at least one witness out there today? And so I remember before I went to grad school, I was trying uh, to get uh, a new car uh, because my old one was just reached the end of its life cycle. And see, the problem was my credit was not strong enough to be able to get approved for a new car. And so what my parents did was they decided to co-sign for me to get a new car. And I need you to know that I was approved, not because of my credit, but on the strength of somebody else's credit. Now I need you to know that I made every payment on time, not because I was trying to be approved, but because I was so thankful that they put their name on the line that my gratitude showed up in a perfect performance. Y'all missed your shout. I didn't do it to get approved. I had already been approved. I was just so thankful for what they did, I had to validate their trust in me. And see, how many of us know that salvation is a divine cosign? You can't get approved on your merit. You get approved on the strength of his credit. But the reason I live right is not to get saved. I'm already saved. I'm on Jesus' credit. But I live right because I'm so thankful that he co-signed my foolishness. Oh, God. That I want to walk up rightly to validate his trust in me. Are y'all hearing the word today? Second thing the story of Jonah teaches us quickly is that you can't tell who's going to repent by looking at them. Friends, the word says that Nineveh is in such bad shape that their wickedness comes up before the Lord. In other words, their transgressions are so great, their iniquities are so gross that God puts a 40-day clock on their existence. And it's crazy because when God sends Jonah to Nineveh, it is not just to bend Jonah's will to his wishes, but because he knows there are folk in Nineveh that can be saved if he gives them another chance. Now, the crazy thing is, saints, that you would never know that Nineveh would repent by looking at them. Okay. Do you realize that Nineveh's repentance comes after the peak of their wickedness? Okay, well, where the church at today? Like their repentance literally falls on the heels of the peak of their wickedness. In other words, Nineveh can't go no further. Nineveh can't get any worse. Nineveh can't go down anymore morally. Nineveh cannot get further from God. But how many of us realize that sometimes the dawn comes right after the darkness? And it's crazy because, well, there's something about the sinful nature that sometimes you have to reach an exhaustion point, that sometimes the sinful nature has to go as far as it can go, that sometimes the sinful nature has to bottom out. And isn't it interesting that sometimes, sometimes you've got to go all the way out before you can go all the way in. Ooh, this is crazy. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the best members used to be the worst sinners? And the reason that's the case is because you are fully persuaded in your own mind. You know this world ain't got nothing out there for you. You all the way in because you used to be all the way out. But the reason some of us are not all the way in is because we ain't never went all the way out. And we still think there's something out there in our benefits. And it's crazy because Nineveh turns around on the heels of its worst spiritual day. Why am I saying that? I'm saying this on behalf of some praying mother. 
some praying grandmother, some praying auntie who is praying for some child to turn around, some uh, husband to turn around, some wife to turn around, and you're looking at where they are today. And for somebody, it looks like they can't get worse. It seems like they'll never turn around. It seems like they can never see the light. But if you learn anything from Nineveh, that sometimes repentance is right there on the heel of wickedness. And the word to somebody today is don't turn up your position, your petition. Don't cease your prayers because God does a work that you can't see with your eyes. In other words, when you look at John chapter 3, John Jesus compared the work of the Holy Spirit to being likened unto the work of the wind. He says, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. In fact, the only reason you know the wind is blowing is because the leaves are rustling and the limbs of the tree are shaking. How many of us know that the work of the Spirit is an invisible work? So what I want to encourage us to do is no, you can't judge a book by its cover. What do you mean? Y'all remember that in Luke chapter 11, when Jesus preached to the Pharisees, he says that Nineveh is going to stand up in judgment of this generation. Because they heard the word and repented. In other words, if you saw the Pharisees and they phylacteries and priestly garments and you saw those wretched folk turning up in Nineveh, you would assume that these are the ones that would repent. But those were the ones that hardened themselves against Christ while those in Nineveh are the ones that repented at the word. And what I'm saying to somebody today is you can't tell who's going to repent. By looking at them. Matter of fact, spend less time looking at their appearance. Spend more time looking at your own soul. Stop trying to get the plank out of somebody else's eye and get the beam out of your own eye. The old song said it this way, sweep around your own front door before you try to sweep around mine. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? Because I need you to know the spirit works beneath the surface. It works in a way that your eyes can never detect. You can never really see what it is that the spirit is doing inside of a person. It's crazy, man. man the spirit works even in our worst wickedness. Have you ever noticed how when somebody gets drunk, they always want to debate religion? Oh, y'all quiet. Oh, y'all like, oh, that ain't never been you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Or when somebody gets high, they want to talk about the doctrine of the church. Have you ever noticed that even when you're on the club, there is something that don't feel right about being there? Come on and say amen today. I mean, the real truth is that I don't even get worried when somebody's mad at the church because when you're mad, it's because there's still love. I don't get scared when they get mad. I get scared when they get indifferent toward church. And what I'm saying to somebody today is that the Spirit does its work underneath the surface. And that's why sometimes you got to pray and plant and let God do the rest. See, how many of us know that God hadn't called us to convert nobody? Am I preaching to anybody today? God has not called you to do the work of the Holy Spirit. God has called you to sow a seed and God is going to water and in due time, God is going to give it the increase. Third thing, I'm getting away from me. My time is getting away. Third thing this teaches friends of mine is that sometimes people are more condemning than God. It's crazy, church. The more I read this story, the more contempt I have for my man Jonah. I ain't gonna lie, I have developed, man, this robust dislike for the man of God, Jonah, after looking at this the last couple of weeks. I realized that the most foolish character in scripture, listen, it is not Cain, it is not, man, Enoch, it is not Cain, it, it is not Jacob, it is not Esau, it is not Jezebel, it's not Ahab, it's not Judas. Do you realize the most ridiculous character in the word we reading about him his name is Jonah now in other words see what Jonah shows us is what happens when you have the truth but the truth doesn't have you 
It shows us when, what happens when you got the right beliefs and the right doctrine, man, and the right day, but you ain't got no Holy Spirit inside of you. I mean, I, I mean, come on, saints. I, are y'all hearing this thing? Jonah preaches repentance and gets mad because the folk repent and he thinks they are not worthy of it. And see, the problem with Jonah is that like some of us, we've yet to realize that all people are God's people. Are we clear on this fundamental truth that God is not in the destroying business? God is in the saving business. See, see, he wanted God to see the Assyrians the way he saw them. And see, and this is why, man, I cannot get, man, with this, this Christian nationalism that is emerging here in the United States that tries to pronounce judgment on everybody that doesn't look a certain way or believe a certain thing. See, I'm just at a place where I believe that all people are God's people. See, some of us think the Jews are only God's people. Remember the covenant that was made with Abraham. He says, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In other words, there is no, no, no hierarchy in Christ. See, we walk around talking about how we are God's remnant people. No, we are not. We have God's remnant message. Oh, y'all, y'all offended. No, no, the remnant people have yet to be established. See, the remnant means those who are left so that after the earth is being done shaking, we don't know who's going to still be standing. And what I need somebody to know is that God loves all people. Man, God loves gay people. God loves smoking people. He loves drinking people. He loves white people. He loves black people. He loves Asian people. He even loves Republicans. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. See, y'all don't want to say amen because y'all don't like Trump's people, but they are God. Oh, y'all. God loves all people. Are y'all... <laughs> Uh, I feel like I'm about to get canceled online. Y'all pray for the pastor. Today. I mean, church, ah, I got to end the sermon, but I need you to get the absurdity of this. Man, Jonah's sitting there on the hill underneath the plant looking to see what happens. Man, and when he sees God showing mercy, <laughs> your boy Jonah gets big mad. He was like, man, God, see, I told you this when I was still in Tarshish. See, the reason I didn't want to go was not because I was going to face persecution. It's not because my preaching was going to be in vain. The reason I didn't want to go is not because, man, I was going to suffer uh, uh, ridicule at the hands of those that did not believe. But he says, the reason I did not want to go is because you, God, are too merciful and you're too gracious and you're abundant in love and you always relent from punishing people like they did deserve to be punished. And it's crazy because Jonah's literally standing in his second chance. Standing in the grace of God. Every breath he breathes is mercy. And yet he is going to complain that somebody else is less deserving of the mercy he is walking in. And he's mad with God because he's too good. Oh, God. <laughs> Anybody mad that God is that good to his children? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And see, quickly, see, Jonah shows us why Jesus had to come. This quote here from Steps to Christ, I want you to take a look at this quickly here with me today. In the book, Steps to Christ, the, uh, uh, the prophet of God literally says, the enemy of good blinded, mind, blinded minds, the minds of men, so that they looked upon God with what? They thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief uh, attribute is stern justice, one who is a severe judge, a harsh exacting creditor. 
He pictured the creator as a being who watches with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgments upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live amongst men. See, we think Jesus just came to die. That was his final work. But his primary work was to say, man, listen, man, I sent prophets. I sent apostles. I sent the Jewish nation. I sent them to be ambassadors to show the world what I was like. But they literally bought discredit to my image and my character. So I've got to show up so the world knows what God is like. And my question for the church is, as ambassadors, do we give glory to God in our characters? Or do we discredit him? And I need church you to realize, do you realize, friends, that Satan's greatest deception was not the change of the Sabbath? It's not the mystery of the state of the dead. It is not to get people to eat the wrong food. His greatest mystery was to get people to look at God that way. To get them to have a fear-based relationship with God. And the reason he wants us operating out of fear is you realize that fear and love can never coexist. Because perfect love casts out all fear. And it's crazy because he has been so powerful in this particular deception that we literally, in our minds and in our flawed theology, you realize what we do? We actually make a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. We literally walk around like God is bipolar. Like, like, he, like he was one way in the Old Testament and he's a different way in the New Testament. Some of us literally believe that God, that, that Jesus had to come to save us from the Father. But how many of us know that Jesus was sent to us by the Father? In other words, the son is not more loving than the father. He says, I am the father of one. That's why he told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And see, friends of mine, I need us to understand the truth about God's character because sometimes, man, we're so exacting, so harsh, so, man, judgmental, so stringent in the way we communicate truth that we have literally done harm to the character of God. So I need us to see some things in the word. Can I take you to the word for just a moment? And I'm done. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. See, I need you to know that we begin, we make this distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. But I need you to make sure you see God in the right light. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. When you get to let me hear you say amen. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Last book in the Old Testament. Open up those Bibles today. Malachi 3 and verse 6. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm here. Malachi 3 and verse 6, he says, for I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Did y'all catch that, church? See, when we say that the Lord, he does not change, we man, make it matters of liturgy and worship. Man, we say, man, this is why we ought not be singing nothing but hymns, and this is why Sabbath school has to start a certain time. But when God says, I don't change, what he is talking about is his love and his long suffering. He says, if I ever changed Jacob, I would have destroyed you a long time ago. So there is no difference between the God of the old covenant and the God of the new covenant. The God of the new covenant just ratified. Do you realize that the new covenant is an outgrowth or the fulfillment of the first? Are y'all hearing me today? All right, I see y'all still don't believe, so we can go a little bit further in the word uh, this afternoon. Go with me to Exodus 34 and verse 6. Exodus, second book of the Bible, chapter 34 and verse 6. Because truth is that most of us, only believe what people say about God, but we don't even know how God describes himself. Exodus 34 and verse number six. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Exodus 34 and verse six. Matter of fact, look at verse five. The Bible says, now the Lord descended in the cloud with him and there proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, what? Merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. 
Are y'all catching this? See, you realize that the Bible says, he literally says about himself that I'm slow to anger. In other words, God is not some temperamental ticking time bomb waiting to explode, but God literally, man, the only thing God is slow to do is get mad. Oh God, I, <laughs> are y'all catching this today? He is not slow to hear your prayers. He is not slow to supply your needs. He is not slow to fight your battles. The only thing God takes his time doing is giving you what you deserve. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And see, I need you to know that when you change the way you see God, it affects the way you see his law. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 24. Deuteronomy, there in the Old Testament, 6 and verse 24. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. Now, again, if I begin to change the way I see God, it begins to change the way I relate to him, and it changes the way I relate to his law. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 24. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm here. And the Bible says, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Okay. Do we get the purpose of the law, friends? The law, friends of mine, is not for my salvation. The law is for my prosperity. In other words, I don't keep the law to be saved. I'm saved. But keeping the commandments of the Lord are simply a script to health and prosperity and long life. In other words, let me say it this way. Obedience is not salvation. Obedience is self-care. See, self-care is not just getting your nails done. It's not just going to the spa. It's not just getting the massage at Hands and Stones. I need you to know self-care is obeying everything that God put in his word because you understand that God has great plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. It is his law that sustains and preserves and it keeps us from all harm and all wickedness. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? So that even when you look at a story like Sodom and Gomorrah, or even when you look at Noah's flood, I need you to know we look at these little moments of destruction and we paint these broad strokes over the character of God. I need you to know whenever somebody gets destroyed, what it actually is proof of is that there was nothing else God could do to save them. It's crazy. Your boy Jonah, man, he is mad because God shows mercy to the disobedient. I mean, are we seeing the absurdity of this? That a sinner gets mad when God shows grace to other sinners. And I'm just at a place, friends of mine, where even if I don't like you, and God still shows long suffering to you. I ain't getting in my feelings about that. Because man, if I think you don't deserve grace, it just means God is still giving grace to the undeserving. But see, the problem is you don't see yourself as undeserving. But do I have at least seven undeserving saints in the room today that can say, man, I'm not here because I'm worthy. I'm not here because I deserve good. I am still standing because God is slow to get angry. He is abundant in mercy. He is full of grace and he is abounding in truth. And so guess what? I don't get mad when I see grace. I celebrate every time I see the grace of God. Listen, I'm done. Last story. Listen, I remember one time I was in, uh, in, in Newark Airport, and this was a day, man, where there was all types of stuff going on, thunderstorms in the area, and, and, and 
And as a result, man, flights were delayed all over the country. And so my flight got delayed coming out of Newark a little bit. And when I get there to my layover space, what happens is, man, we get there late. Man, we're stuck at the gate. And I'm afraid that I'm going to miss my connection. And so, man, when I finally get off of the plane, I'm running as fast as I can. And even though I know it's not yet time for the plane to depart, how many of us know that before the plane departs, they actually close the door at the gate about 20 minutes before the plane actually departs and so you don't have to get your departure time you got to get there before the door closes and guess what man I'm running as fast as I can to get to my gate and when I get there upon the time where I see the number of my gate from a distance I can tell that there is nobody sitting in the concourse there is nobody sitting there and I'm afraid because I think I missed my flight when I turn around at the corner. I see there's nobody at the counter. And guess what? The gate of the door is just about closed. But when I get a little bit closer, I can see a crack in the gate. And there are four fingers holding the gate open, which meant I still had a little time. And so when I get there to the gate, they say, you must be Mr. Snail. I said, how did you know my name? They said, when you landed, somebody radioed ahead of you, told us that you were coming. So we decided to hold the door open until you had time in order to make your flight. And do I have seven folk who are thankful that the Holy Spirit knew you were coming? radio to the sun and said hold back the winds don't let it blow I've got some children that are still on their way to the gates anybody grateful that the door was left open that the gate is still open that he's left mercy for you and I to be saved so guess what so I get in and I get seated at my seat and then my seat next to me is empty. And then after I come on, about four minutes later, somebody else comes on. And then when the other brother comes on, dad, guess what he starts doing? He starts apologizing. He's like, man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hold everybody up, but I didn't get mad because we had to wait for him. Guess what? I said, praise God, because they waited for me. I know we want Jesus to come quickly, but before you get mad that he's taking too long, you ought to just say, Lord, I thank you that you held it long enough for me to get in the ark of safety, and I'll wait a little longer so my kids can get in. I'll wait a little longer so my spouse can come in. I'll wait a little longer so your kids can come in. Don't get mad that the gate has been left open because God wants all men to be saved and come to repentance. Somebody glorify the God of grace, the God of mercy, the God of long suffering, the God who wants all men and women to be saved. I'm so thankful. And this is why it's bad even when I want to preach short. I have to preach it with a certain thoroughness because I know where God has brought me from and that's why I don't want you to ever be impressed with none of this ecclesiastical stuff you see up here ain't nothing but a sinner saved by grace that's all it is don't be impressed by nobody in a pew all we are is sinners saved by grace that somebody left the door open for And what I need somebody, somebody's to be clear on today 
is that salvation is never about our merit or our work or our worthiness. It is about how God loves all people. And I need somebody to be clear on the fact that yes, there is going to be a day of judgment. There's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to come a time where Jesus shows up, man. Guess what? The door is going to be closed. But I need you to know that the set there, that you know, all of heaven is going to be full of joy. But I need you to know that there's going to be one sorrow in heaven. Because when God sees those created in his image, I believe that heaven will weep a stream of tears. But those that had second chance and third chance and fourth chance and a hundred chances and said no to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need you to know that the worst sinner in hell is going to be some, some SDA. who had the truth but it never had them who had the form of godliness but never experienced its power and what I want to do just briefly we serve the God not just of a second chance but that second chance stuff that was out the window a long time ago but there is somebody today that God has given another chance. He's given you new life for a reason. He's renewed your breath for a reason. He woke you and he brought you here, got you watching this service for a reason today. That you might come to know him, the true and living God, and experience the love of God, the, the intimate love of the Savior. And there is somebody today that needs to say yes to Jesus Christ. There's somebody that needs to receive his love. And I need you to know that, that gratitude for this second or, or gratitude for another chance is not just hallelujah or thank you, Jesus. The proof of your gratitude is a committed, submitted heart to him. There's somebody today that needs to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, that word blessed me, and I hope that word blessed you. Listen, if this message helped you, if it added any value to your life, do me a favor. I need you, if you're on Facebook, listen, hit the share button. If you're on YouTube, copy that link, send it to somebody. Be a digital disciple. Be an Apple apostle. Listen, be an electronic evangelist. There's somebody else that needs the word today. So listen, God bless you. You have a great and victorious week. I look forward to seeing you next time. Have you ever dreaded the start of a new week? Has the start of a new week ever felt too big for you? I want to help you out with that. Breath of Life presents Fresh Start Sunday. It's a series of programs designed to help you face the new week with a reset, a kickstart, to just begin with a whole new energy. Every first and third Sunday, I invite you to join me in the Scripture Lab. When I'm in the lab, we're going to be testing, breaking down, and applying the Word of God. It's going to be a space where we answer your questions, settle disputes, and help you come to conclusions about doctrine and larger social issues. Every second Sunday, I invite you to join Gianna and myself as we begin a series of conversations around dating and relationships entitled Points of View. We're going to be sharing from our own experience and we're going to be joined by an array of experts and panelists designed to help build us up and be strengthened in the areas of dating and marriage. And every fourth Sunday is what we're calling Vision Sunday. Pastor Nugent and I are going to be reaching out to pastors, ministry leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, writers, inventors to make sure that those visions don't get stuck in your head but that they might be able to be implemented in your daily experience. Friends, we're done fearing the new week. We're done dreading what's to come. We're going to start the week with hope, beginning the day with encouragement and clarity, because the best way to have a great finish is to have a fresh start. Join us starting in the month of July, every Sunday at 10 a.m. 
I look forward to seeing you for a fresh start. What's good, family? One of the things that makes the faith journey hard is incrementalism. It's where we test God, where we try God, where we try to ease our way into it. But I need you to know that faith doesn't work in increments. The faith journey only works when you go all the way in. I wanna invite you to join me on August 26th as we begin a new teaching series entitled All The Way In. It's a call away from middle of the road Christianity, but to be fully committed and invested in Jesus Christ. We're gonna spend several weeks looking at Bible characters who went all the way in with Jesus. And then I wanna encourage you to join us on Sunday, August 27th, as we begin 21 days of prayer. We're gonna be utilizing my book, All The Way In. It's a 21 day guide to spiritual revolution. We're gonna meet each Monday through Friday at six o'clock a.m. online. And then we'll meet Saturday and Sundays, Saturdays at 8 a.m., Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. It's gonna be a powerful time of prayer, praise, testimony, and encouragement. The body of Christ is gonna be built up in every needed way. Listen, I need you to know, man, the spiritual journey doesn't work when you're part of the way in. It doesn't work if you're most of the way in. It only works when you go all the way in. If you wanna get a copy of the book all the way in, if you're in Huntsville, go to the Oakwood University Church Market. If you're outside of the city of Huntsville, go to our website, go to our market store at www.breathoflife.tv. For the past 49 years, Breath of Life has been presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ from a contemporary urban perspective. In 2023, we plan to grow our reach and your donations are what help make that possible. This year, our major goal is to launch our Breath of Life weekly broadcast into five new cities. In addition, we're excited to introduce our new Breath of Life Kids platform with original content created with your little ones in mind. We'll continue with innovative programming dynamic preaching, and sharing the gospel through evangelistic campaigns. Here are the five ways that you can give. You can give online at breathoflife.tv, by mail at P.O. Box 5960, Huntsville, Alabama, 35814, by phone at area code 256-929-6460, or by texting the phrase, give the number two, B-O-L-T-V, to 1-888-364-GIVE or by cash app at dollar sign Breath of Life TV. Every single dollar you give goes right back into the ministry and allows us to share the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. We pray that God's favor will overtake you as a result of your generous gifts to Breath of Life. God bless you.